be horrified in the righteous, holy, unmatchless name of Jesus Christ our Lord. You may have your seats. I was in my bed a, a couple of days ago, about a week ago, and I woke up, my alarm clock woke me up, or my watch, it just shakes and wakes me up. I don't really have an alarm clock, but when I got up, I immediately heard the word scar tissue. And I was like, I didn't have a dream about anything that has to do with that. So God, let me go do some research on scar tissue. Never doubt who you hear. Because there's a spirit on the inside of you that only God placed there. And so you need to make sure that you're listening and being unctioned by what the Holy Spirit is saying in this season because it's necessary. And so I went to do some research on scar tissue. And so when I get when you get injured, if you get a cut, you develop a scar. And scars are necessary. They are a necessary part of the healing process. You may get cut and then it scabs over and it may leave a scar. I have some scars. I have some scars where my brother decided he wanted to see how hot a, 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 a butter knife would be. And then he asked, could he stick it on my arm? And I said, no, but he did it anyway. So I have a scar that's a reminder that I got burnt by a knife and he got his butt whooped. But it nevertheless, there's a scar there. But what you don't understand is that when the skin is wounded, the tissues break, which causes this thing called collagen to be released in your body to start the healing process. Collagen is thicker than the rest of our skin, and it builds up where the tissue is damaged, helping to heal and strengthen the wound. New collagen continues forming for several months, and the blood supply increases causing the scar to become raised or lumpy sometimes. It depends on what type of scar it is. The deeper the wound, the more the scar tissue, the more the collagen, the more it builds up under your skin. So if I have a surgical procedure, the collagen builds a little bit deeper. If I have a heart attack, the collagen actually builds up a little bit deeper. And so the deeper the scar is, the more the body releases this collagen and makes that wound a little harder. I've had a surgery, a couple of surgeries in my life, and I, my daughter's had a surgery, and she has some scars, and I have a couple of scars in some places. And that place where the collagen, sometimes there's some numbness around that area or some tingling still around that area because of the scar tissue that's underneath. And so scar tissue can develop on the skin as a result, like I said, of surgery. Some of us may have keloidal skin, that there's keloid that comes up because of a cut or because you get your ears pierced. You might see somebody with a keloid on the back of their ear. That's scar tissue that is formed to try to protect the body. Like I said, it's a natural part of the body's healing process, and no two scars are the same. Each person's scars heal differently. It can take up to 12 to 18 months after an injury or an operation for a scar to heal. Right now I'm talking about external scars. There are several different types of medication, radiation, and other therapies that can be prescribed to lessen scar tissue, the internal part. But Research says that only a few of those things are actually successful. <laughs> Scars can lead to people experiencing emotional and psychological distress from their appearance. Yeah. 
I had a birthmark on my face, but for many years, people thought that it was a scar, and they would ask, did you get to, into a fight? I don't know, but every scar that I have on my skin has turned darker. It's never turned lighter, except in the beginning of the healing process. But no, no, no. In that moment, I thought that this was ugly because people kept looking at it and asking me questions about it. And so it caused me some psychological distress. Right now I'm talking about external scars, but you're going you gonna to catch it in a minute because there are some scars that happen when daddy leaves and there are some scars that happen when mama leaves and there are some scars that happen when we set molestation. There are some scars that happen when... We grow up in situations that we don't think we deserve to be in. There's some scars. There's some scars. There's some scars. That's some external things. But what you don't realize is that it's building up some internal scar tissue. So while there's external scars, when you are wounded, mother wounds, father wounds, molestation wounds, abandonment wounds, divorce wounds, poverty wounds. You put that wound that has happened to you, absent parent wounds, suicide wounds, isolation wounds, that those things are internal things that you can't see externally, but I can tell you we can see them externally. I love, I love, I love that my my pastor, my husband surprised me by that introduction. But what I can tell you, and I said this a long time ago, is that I may see the external scars, but who God has made me helps me see some internal scars. And I just want you to know, I said this a couple of weeks ago, that sometimes people who don't want to recognize and realize that they've got some internal scars. They, they make me itch a little bit because they keep saying, I'm all right, I'm good, I'm good. But your attitude don't say you good. I'm good, I'm good, but your drug habit don't say you good. I'm, I'm good, I'm good, but your staying up late at night don't say you good. I'm, I'm good, I'm good, but you cussing out me every time you see me. I'm good. And you might not say the cuss word, but your eyes say it. I'm good, I'm good, but... Scar tissue, scar tissue, scar tissue, scar tissue keeps you from the house of God, scar tissue, scar tissue keeps you from worshiping God, scar tissue, scar tissue keeps you from going deeper because you don't want to feel what God is trying to get off you, scar tissue. It's that internal damage that you can't see because scar tissue is deep on the inside and we buy things and we seek promotions and we work ourselves to death and we seek elevation and we do all these things we buy houses we buy clothes we buy all this stuff thinking it's gonna make me happy so we put external bandages on things that we hope is gonna be some internal healing I'm here to tell you today that it don't work. I tried it. It don't work. I tried to heal the molestation wound. It don't work. I bought houses. I spent money. I bought cars. I bought clothes. And it don't work. But I can sit here and tell you that the clothes today that's on my back, it ain't because I'm trying to cover up some things. The clothes that's on me today says I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm delivered because I allowed the God, the Almighty Father, to look at every scar, every piece of tissue that was beneath and he healed that thing we have to take a deeper look at what has happened externally to cause internal scar tissue to develop and I can tell you I know a God who can heal it all that medicine can't fix it he you need a God that can take it all away that drinking can't fix it you need a God that can take it all away sexing can't fix it you need a God that can take it all away internal scars 
internal scar, scar tissue, scar tissue, scar tissue. Lord, Lord, Lord. All right, so when we we find the story of Hezekiah, we find it in several books in the in the Bible. You can find this story in Isaiah and in 2 Chronicles. But today we're going to take a look at the text in 2 Kings. When we get to the text, Hezekiah has become king at the age of 25, and this was after King Ahaz, his father, had ruled. And if you know anything about King Ahaz, the Bible says that he had done a lot of idol worship. He closed the doors of the temple. He said that he didn't want to do some things. He started looking in other places to get help to heal the internal thing. He was looking for external things to do it. And so he had worshiped idols and brought all these things thinking that other idols can save him. I think I just told you earlier that buying things can't heal the internal wounds. But King Ahaz did, and he was unfaithful to the Lord. Like I said, he shut the Lord's temple and He set up altars at every street corner in Jerusalem. He built high places to burn sacrifices to other gods in every town in Judah. He thought that worshiping other gods was beneficial to the kingdom. Hmm. 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 Worshiping other gods is beneficial to the kingdom. I'm going to put a pin right there for two seconds because I want you to understand that when you worship other jobs, I mean gods, <laughs> when you worship other kids, I mean jobs, and I mean gods, and when you worship other things that it, mm, it ain't going to work out, internal wounds, internal scars, scar tissue, come out and somebody look at your neighbor and say scar tissue. So Hezekiah ruled for 29 years, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. It says that there was nobody that was reigned before him and nobody that was after him that did these things. They compared him to David in so many ways. He came back and he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and he repaired them. Remember his father, to say generational curses. His father had covered, closed the doors. His father had did these things, but he decided, which says to me that even when there's a bad person that raised you, that God can still raise you up because he is Abba. It doesn't matter what your mom and daddy did. You don't have to live in that place. It doesn't doesn't matter what your brother and sister did you don't have to live in that place and so because his dad was evil he decided that he was gonna serve ye the Lord some people got to make a choice today because you want to sit on the laurels that well my mom and them did and my daddy and them did but hey 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 there's a God who said that I'm closer than a brother then I'm a mother to the motherless and a father to the fatherless and we are crying over some situations and God is saying you made that an idol I need you to look to me I need you to stop focusing on that and I need you to look to me because there's healing deeper than what you see and so you bit so Hezekiah opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them and He brought back Levitical priesthood, the Levites. He put them back in their rightful place, and he brought worship back to Judah. He brought worship back to Judah. He fought to tear down the idols his father put in place. There are some people in this building that need to fight to tear down the idols that generational curses have put in place you got to be able to identify those things and tear them down your eyes can see that it doesn't look like God because if you're not prospering as your soul prospers then you got some idols you need to tear down some generational curses that's got to go if it's not looking like what God says that it should look like it's got to go Hezekiah was a reformer He tore down the idols and brought worship and praise and honor back to God and refurbished the temple. 
I, I, I'm talking about my temple right now for a second. Because if I'm going to bring worship and honor and glory back to God, what does your temple look like? Because it might look good on the outside, but I ain't worried about your outside. I'm worried about your inside right now because God doesn't look at the external thing. He looks at the... And so right now, it's an internal check time. This is temple check time because if my temple can't worship and when the worshipers are up on the stage and you sitting there with your eyes open and looking at them and they looking at you and you looking at them and they looking at you, but you still had moved, then somewhere God ain't moving your heart. If you miss in worship, let me remind you that the moment that we worship, the angels in heaven start singing holy, 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 and they bow before him. But if you can't worship, then ain't no angels singing holy for you. Because I was making sure that they were singing holy every time I raised my hands today. I wanted to make sure that he knew that Terry was praising him this morning. Because I can't praise I'm not going to let a rock cry out for me. No, no, no. I ain't going to get ahead of myself. I ain't going to get ahead of myself. I'm going to stay on my tick. So the temple went down because the worship ceased. Ahaz ceased the worship. Hezekiah brought worship back. But he couldn't bring worship back without restoring the worshipers first. So he restored the worshipers first, and then he brought the temple back. He restored the worshipers first, and then he brought the temple back. I don't know about you, but there's some restoring the worshipers that need to happen in this place. Something has killed your worship. Something has tried to take worship out of your spirit. And this morning, God wants to restore the worship back to you. It's a heart posture this morning that my heart has to know that I got to worship him in spirit and in truth. Is what the Bible says. I can't decide, oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Oh, yeah, Lord. That, that is just bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is in, within me. I got to restore the worshipers first so that when they come into the temple, they know what to do. I got to restore the worship first. And don't ever let worship depart from my lips. We are going to worship him forever. This is just practice right now. This is practice right now. So I'm going to give you about two seconds to take moment to practice right now to see if you're going to make the team because God says they who worship me shall worship me in spirit and in truth. I don't know about you, but I ain't letting a rock cry out for me. I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to call on his great name. He made a way out of no way. He shifted some things on my behalf. And so I shall worship him. I shall worship you. God, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. I honor you, oh God. You're worthy. See, chains break when you worship. See, things happen when you worship. The devil has to back up off of you when you worship because he don't like worship. See, he got kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be prideful and not worship the Lord. He wanted people to worship him. I don't need your worship. I don't need your praise. But what I do need is a God who's going to set me right on Monday, who's going to chase some demons out of my way on Tuesday, who's going to block destruction on my mind and my heart on Wednesday. I need to worship him. I need 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 him. Work on the worshipers, God. Work on the worshipers, God. Bring your worshipers forth, God. Those that scar tissue has tried to hold back from worshiping because it's calling them pain. Break it off now, God. Break it off now, God. Break it off now, God. Loose it now, God. Loose it now, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Break it off. 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 We, the 
temple was an outer sign of inner corruption. We worry about the symptoms of the external things and we fail to pull the root up that's keeping us from being a worshiper. Don't fix the temple if you ain't gonna fix the worshipers first, Hezekiah. And he did it in order. Hezekiah also fought for the pilgrimages. He brought back the celebration of the Passover. I don't even know about you, but that's enough for me to praise even there because I will tell you that the Passover was when the blood was wiped over the, uh, the thing and the plague came through and took out those who didn't have it. Ahaz took that out. Hezekiah restored that. The Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he brought all that back. He was a warrior. He fought hard. He had to fight the Philistines and then Sennacherib. He had to fight him. He was a warrior and see what I'll tell you right now is that Sennacherib was calling out God like your God ain't going to do this. Your God ain't going to do that. Your God ain't going to do this. And Hezekiah told his people don't even say nothing. Don't say nothing. See sometimes we want to fight with our mouth. We want to fight with our mouth and say things. And now I, I, God's just saying today don't say nothing. Because if you let me do the fight, now I will do it and you will still be honored. If you let me do the fight, now I'll do it and your character will still be in check. If you let me fight, sometimes we just got to close our mouth and not say a word. Because he was told what was going to happen by the prophet Isaiah. And I don't know about you, but I'm a prophetic this morning. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen this morning. And you can take heed to the word or you can just let it slide off your back. But I'm telling you what's going to happen this morning. Because there's a prophet in the house. And you can listen to the prophet or you cannot listen to the prophet. Had I Hezekiah not listened to the prophet, he probably would have ran. But he needed to be still. Because Sennacherib wasn't even allowed to come into the place. He woke up in 85 scars. I mean people. 85,000. 85,000 were dead. Hezekiah didn't have to go fight him. God did it for him. 85,000 were dead. And he said, Sennacherib, you shall die by the sword. Sennacherib took off and went back and got back and his sons killed him. God took care of it. Stop trying to fight the battle on your own. Let him fight it. Keep your mouth shut and you pray. God will take care of the rest. If you let him be in his rightful place, stop thinking you big enough and bad enough to do it. Yes, God is giving you some power and authority, but he didn't tell you to take his. He didn't tell you to take his. He didn't tell you to take his. Hezekiah was a warrior. He was influenced by Isaiah. He reestablished order. Reestablished order. Reestablished order. Reestablished order. But even when I reestablish order, things don't always go right. Hezekiah's story is even significant to help you remember that bad things do happen to good people. The human side of us would say, his father deserved it. If Ahaz had been you know, told, get your house in order, you're going to die, you would have been like, yep, you should have did what God said you were supposed to do. But what happens when Hezekiah sets everything back in order and God sends a word that says, you're going to die. You're going to die. It shows us that none of our righteousness exempts us from pain. It shocks us when good people die. I, I know it was like, oh my God, he was a worshiper and he he was a you know he he sold out for the Lord and he he this and he that and how how did God take him home now? And I don't understand. Good things, bad things happen to good people. There are times that we are broken in ways that are confusing to have such a good tracker, track record, what happens? What happens? Where did I go wrong, God? Why am I going through this stuff? You can't, you can't love me if, 
if you allow this stuff to happen, but why me? Why me? Why me? Why am I suffering with the cancer? Why, why am I losing my possessions? Why am I getting divorced? Why, God, I was the best wife that I could be? Why? Why, 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 why? What happens when it seems like faith is just not enough? Hezekiah was a warrior. He was a worshiper. But he got stuck in a rough place when Isaiah came and said, set your house in order. (laughs) Sometimes God will send word that something external is happening to reveal what's going on internally. When things are bad, do I worship Do I pray? Do I have faith? Where do my eyes go during that time? Do I lean on my own understanding? Do I look to the left or to the right? Do I look towards the... What do I do? What do I do? What do I do, God? What do I do? What do I do? These things are trying to kill me. What do I do? So Isaiah, he he goes to visit... And he tells Hezekiah he's going to die. And if you want to read the prayer that Hezekiah prayed because he chose to seek the Lord's face, even in that. In Isaiah 38, (laughs) Hezekiah says to God, the grave cannot praise you. It's in the word. You can't get glory out of me dying, but if you keep me alive, I promise you that I'll praise you. See, sometimes we promise God some things if he gets us out of situations and we don't do it. God, if you if you get this bill paid, I promise you I won't let my situation. And then as soon as the sale pop up on Timu, you over there shopping. It's a sign, Lord. It's a sign. This is supposed to, that's they just in my size. Let me get that. God, I promise you I won't cuss them out no more if you just let me find a husband and hear the husband come like beep, 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 beep. You but you told the Lord that you that's what you told him. How many times have we promised God that we're gonna do something, but we don't follow what we promised? God, if you bring her back, I promise I'll do this. And then you bring them back, and then you still putting your mouth on the wrong thing. God, did. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall where there was nothing there but him and God. I don't care what's behind me right now. I'm going to turn my face to the wall because I need my focus to be right here on God. God, I praise you like nobody else. I restored your temple. I didn't let a rock cry out for me when things were going crazy. I worshiped you in spirit and in truth. How dare God let me live? Let me live. I want to have so much prayers that God says, I'm going to shift some things in your family's behalf because of the way you pray. I'm going to do some things different in your life because of the way you pray. You pray today and your great, great, great grandkids are going to be blessed because of the way that you prayed. I can worship my phone, but I can't worship the, oh. I'm listening for a song that's going to heal me. Oh, no, 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 no. The song is between you and heaven right now. I need that to heal me because if ain't no silence, if silence is in the house, I just need to find a place with me and God. It don't say in the word that Hezekiah said, I found the Lord when the music was playing. I found him on TikTok. I found him on Instagram. He was doing the latest dance on TikTok. No, he wasn't there. No, no, no. I put my face towards the wall and began to pray 
and reminded God, I've done all these things to turn the people back to you, Lord, to bring revival back to Judah. And this is what I get, Lord. Why, why, why? God, ain't no rock going to cry out for me. I'm going to worship you if you let me live. I'm going to worship you if you bring my children up out of that. I'm going to worship you if you bless my finances. I'm going to worship you, God. Ain't nothing going to keep me from it. I'm going to worship you and be like Seely in the, in the color purple. Only death can keep me from it. Only death can keep me from it. Me, my God, will never part. Only death can keep me from it. I'm going to worship him no matter what. My kids ain't lining up. I'm going to worship him. My money acting funny. I'm going to worship him. I'm going to worship him. And I'm going to remind him of what his word says. I'm going to remind him what his word says. See, I'm going to keep one in the clip right now because, God, I'm going to remind you what your word says. I need to remind you sometime. It ain't that you forgot. I'm reminding me for me. I'm reminding you. And when I do it right, Hezekiah is an example that God added 15 years to his life. May my prayers extend the life of some things that I thought that were dead. May my prayers extend the life. So what can we learn from Hezekiah? I'm getting close to closing. I'm getting close to closing. I'm going to give you a couple of points and I'm going to get out your way. I'm going to tell you that we can learn that revival is necessary. That's my first point. Revival is necessary. We have to stay at the heart of worship. I talked about worship. I gave you a couple of minutes, a seconds to do worship. Some of us still worship. Some of us still didn't. Some of us still worship. Some of us still didn't. Well, God, I was worshiping you in my heart. I need to see the heart manifestation because when I got a whole bunch of tissues over there, when I'm worshiping him in my heart, all my makeup comes off. When I'm worshiping him in my home, sometimes my posture, and even here, my posture changes, and I'm laying prostrate on the floor. It might not look like, hey, God, thank you, Lord, bless your name. It might look like this sometimes. It might look like this sometimes. But God needs it to pour out. It's time for your worship to pour out. It doesn't look like sitting here looking at me and I'm looking at you. He needs you to don't even look at me. Don't see me. See him. He needs it. He needs it. He needs it. Revival. It starts with keeping God in your heart. Internal healing can't happen if you don't stay zealous for God. Revival has to happen. Keep God in his rightful place. Don't allow wounds of your past or present to create scar or tissue that hardens your heart. We may not know all the internal things because we keep covering it up with external bandages. Let me tell you, it doesn't heal you. A deeper place of worship is necessary for a deeper relationship with the healer. You got to make the choice that it's God no matter what. That's the first thing that Hezekiah is an example of. The second is prayer is an anchor. Prayer is your anchor. You've got to pray in every situation. It's the key that gives you access to the king. It's the key that gives you access to the king. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. He sought God's face for wisdom and guidance. God gives us guidance through scripture and godly counsel. He had Isaiah Hezekiah is known for his prayers. I said it before, but I'm going to say it again. May my prayers be so deep and dedicated to God that he adds years onto my life. His words say that, we, that he will restore the years that the canker worm and the locust have eaten. That's what the word of God says in Joel. We, eat, we will eat the good of the land, but we have to pray that every internal wound is healed. Stay in revival turn our face to the wall and pray to the almighty king thirdly we have to remain faith have faith and faithfulness they are a must for this season that we're walking into 
Some of us are in a different season than some others of us. But in every season, faith and faithfulness is necessary. Hezekiah's life is a model of faithfulness and trust in the Lord. His reform shows how deep his beliefs were. He believed in who God was and what God could do. So he restored his temple. He brought worship back to Judah. And he was rewarded with answered prayers, successful endeavors, and miraculous victories over his enemies. God gives us internal victories over the things that continue to try to kill us. But we have to have faith. We have to do the hard thing. It's easy to keep medicating wounds with external pleasures and treasures, but we have to go deeper in order for internal scars to be healed. There's a deeper level of vulnerability that's necessary. You can be hard all you want. Hard. I'm hard. You can be hard all you want. But when your hardness, that scar tissue, won't allow even the healer, the deliverer, to infiltrate it, my God, God's the difference maker, y'all. He knows the difference between surface level faith because it ain't going to get it. He knows the difference. There has to be a desperation that says, I need you more than I need these wounds that are killing me from the inside out. Cancer happens because of internal wounds. Diabetes happens because of internal wounds. High blood pressure happens because of internal wounds. Migraines happen because of internal wounds. You don't have to hold on to those things. Turn your face to the wall. Pray for the God of God of Holy of Holies to heal those things and he will begin to massage and therapy that scar tissue and it breaks it all apart. It that's when the doctor says, wait, 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 there was some cancer there last week, but I don't see it no more. Oh, oh, because I turned my face to the wall. I knew who to turn my face to. I knew who to pray to. I knew who to worship to. And it wasn't surface level prayer that got it. It wasn't surface level worship that got it. It was that thing that got me so deep in my spirit that I couldn't stand up straight. I had to go down on my knees. Let me tell you a little bit about faith. Research from Ohio State University said did a, they did something on the impact of faith and the healing of wounds. Yeah. Yeah. They said it's a, st a statistical fact that people who have faith recover more quickly from wounds. I told you I'm healed. Yeah. They heal more rapidly. They are restored more rapidly. And then the Mayo Clinic kind of followed it up and they did some research and they said that it's a fact that people with more faith age more gracefully. I ain't trying to toot my own horn, but people sure think I'm 29, praise the Lord. It might be because I say it sometimes too, but you know, we're going to keep on going. But people who have faith are less prone to strokes and stress attacks. That's what the research says. But the research did not say that those with faith don't get wounded. It just said that you heal faster. Oh Let me say that again. The research does not say that those with faith don't get wounded. It just says that you heal a little faster. So you're going to have to realize that Roman 8, 28 is true. That all things work together for the good of the Lord. So when things come to attack you, realize that all you got to do is faith that thing. And when I faith that thing, I'm going to recover a little faster. When I faith that thing, I'm going to heal a little faster. And when I faith that thing, I'm going to look a little younger. I've been wounded. But I'm healing faster because of my faith. My faith is anchored in the Lord. My faith is anchored in his word. He's promised me some things and I ain't going to leave until I see him. He promised me some things and I'm not going nowhere until I see him because he's declared that he's adding back the years that the canker worm, that molestation, whoo, that divorce tried to take. I'm in a good marriage. Thank you, Lord. That my children won't die in it. I'm thanking you, Lord, that it might look like they unruly now. But then I turn my face to the wall and I pray to the almighty God. And I know that there's chains breaking, that there's walls that are falling. I know it, I know it, I know it. 
because I got faith for it. So even when they try to buck up at me, I say smile and be like, you know, it's okay. Because here's what I know. God said that he shall deliver them. God said that he shall restore them. And it's not just them. My grandmother died in some stuff. And I'm wearing her ring on today. Because I'm reminding the devil that you can't stop what God is doing in my house. He is blessing us. He is tearing some things down. And no devil in hell has a right to what my grandmothers didn't do. I'm going to do. I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to look the devil square in his face and say, you don't win because my God is bigger than you. You don't win. My daughter will be healed. My son will be restored. My family will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You don't win. Y'all, it'd be a shame to live and die and never been healed from internal wounds. I know for a fact that there's a grandmother in heaven right now that didn't get fully healed from internal wounds. So guess what? She passed the torch to me and I'm running with it. I'm running with it. I'm running with it. I'm running with it on the day because I'm not gonna let her be put to shame because my God said. Faith works. Faith works. Faith works. It heals. It added 15 years to the man's life. Faith works. Faith works. Faith works. We are not healed without bruises. Somebody say scar tissue. The fourth is that we got to guard against pride. The Bible says in verse 13 of 2 Kings that there was nothing in his palace or all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show the Babylonians. So God adds 15 years to his life, and then God tests him is what some of the Bibles say. In Second Chronicles it says Hezekiah's heart was proud. In the book of Isaiah it says God tested him to know what was in his heart. God is doing some elevation in this season, in this house. God is raising some people up who are slaying demons, who are laying hands on the sick and they are being healed, who are pulling our children out of darkness. He's raising some people up who will speak a thing and it will manifest immediately. He's raising some people up. But we got to be mindful of what's in our heart. We can't allow pride to show off everything that God has placed on and inside of us. He's given us the keys to the kingdom. I don't have a right to show my keys to every person that comes around. If God ain't asked me to pray, I ain't about to be the first one jumping up to pray. If God ain't asked me to flag, I'm not going to be jumping up being the first one to flag. Pride. It has to be laid down. And I'm not talking about just right now pride. I'm talking about that as God continues to grow us up. That pride can't overtake. Our motives have to be right. Why am I trying to seek this? I'm going to take it all to God and say, God, I know you gave me this, but don't let me use this gift if it's not my time to use it. I'm not going to get mad because AP Diamond is praying for somebody. No, no, no. That's who God sent for her to pray. I'm not going to even come behind her and pray. Because God didn't send me to that one. We got to be mindful of our heart's posture. When our motives aren't right, we've allowed pride to sleep in, slip in. Check your motives. Always check the motives of your heart. The Bible says your heart is deceitfully wicked. And you may not understand that sometimes, but I can guarantee you there's a Holy Spirit that will jerk you if you allow him to. We're always stuck in a battle between good and evil. Shut the voice of the evil. Listen to the voice of the righteous. We got to make sure that we're not exalting us. Because when we exalt us, we fall. We got to make sure that we're not exalting things, our cars, our houses, our silver, our gold, our money, any of those things. We 
will not allow the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, or the lust of the eyes to overtake us. We won't allow it to be on the throne. We are replacing that thing with God. And I guarantee when you replace those things with God, God will restore some things in your life. The last, and then I'm out of your way, is that we got to raise up a generation. We got to raise up a generation. If you go down further in 2 Kings verse 19, it says the word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah replied, for he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? God, Hezekiah had prayed and God gave him 15 years and all Hezekiah was worried about was peace in his lifetime. What about the generation that's to come? You did great things during your lifetime, but are you raising up a remnant of people? I believe that was a prayer this morning that we're going to raise up a remnant of people that they will not allow the word of God to depart from their lips. See, what happened was when he got finished, he worried about him in his lifetime, but God prayed, destru- gave destruction to Judah over, and his son came and ruled right after that, and his son Manasseh ruled for 55 years, and the Bible said that he did evil in the sight of the Lord some accounts in the Bible say that he was more evil there was none that were more evil than Manasseh and he ruled for 55 years we have to be intentional about breaking the generational curses off of the lives of our children and building a future generation that will love serve and and honor the Lord. Oh my God, I hear you. And that will keep the Lord in his rightful place. That means fathers and mothers got to line up. I don't care if your kid is not in your house every day. That if you are a daddy, you got to line up. Because my child is watching me. And there's two things always at work. My mom or my dad might be praying while the other one's doing all other kind of things. I don't need your money. God supplies. I need you to show me when things are rough that you're going to turn your face to the wall and pray. I need you to show me that when you things are out of alignment, you're going to turn your face to the wall and worship God. I need you to show me. But gay, hey, 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 guess what? If you can't show me, God raises up men and women who will. Thank you, Lord. Because in this house, we're going to show you how to do it. In this house, we will praise the Lord. And if you don't do it, I'm going to do it for you. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. Don't get mad when your children are crying out for Pastor Chad and Lady Terry because you haven't been the example of them. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. You got to line up. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. God's giving you plenty of opportunities. If you choose not to do it, that's on you. A remnant of people that no matter what it looks like, they're going to still serve the Lord. See, Hezekiah had armies coming to try to take him out because Judah had been wrong. Judah had been handed over. He had people that were trying to kill him and get him to bow. I don't care what the situation is. I'm not going to bow to nobody but God. I don't care what it looks like. I shall not bow to anything else but God. I shall not bow. I shall not bow. I shall not bow. I shall not bow. See, the devil messed up when he didn't kill me. He messed up when he didn't kill me. So I'm on, my, I'm on a path to tear his kingdom down. He messed up. He messed up. And what he did was let God remind, let God remind me that he's my strength and that he's my portion, that he's my lion, that he's my lamb, that he's everything that I need, that he's trained my hands how to battle and my fingers how to war. I know, I know where my help comes from. I know. I know. I know. I know. He messed up. He messed up. 
He messed up because he I got introduced to the Holy of Holies. He messed up. He messed up. He messed up. He couldn't kill me when I was five. He messed up. He messed up because when I got 25, I recognized who I was. He messed up. He messed up. He messed up. And I'm here on a path to burn his kingdom down. No matter what, it's going down. No matter what, it's going down. Every idol that's been built in my family's life is going down in the name of Jesus. Hezekiah's name means God has strengthened. God has strengthened. If I put God in his rightful place, he'll strengthen. If I worship him in spirit and in truth, no matter what the situation is, he'll strengthen. If I have my heart posture in revival at all times, he will strengthen. If I don't get selfish and prideful and think it's just about me and it's all about me and I'm not pouring into the youth that God has told me to pour into, if I'm not going on my job where youth are and I'm not breathing life into them, if I'm not speaking to the, even the adults because it's not just about the kids. There are some people on my job that need to be delivered, but I'm not in the rightful place, so therefore God can't strengthen because... And you wonder why you're tired. You wonder why you can't wake up in the morning ready to go fight. God can't strengthen what you haven't given to him. There's some shifting that has to happen today. And I'm going to get to the end right now, but there's some of us who still need strength for the journey. And pastor's been praying for that for a couple of weeks now. And the problem may not be that pastor's prayers aren't working. The problem may be that you're not working. Because there's still yet some internal scars that you're allowing to overtake what God has been trying to put in the inside of you that you go to work and you go home and you take care of this and you do that but you're not putting in the time so that God can strengthen you got this excuse and you got that excuse my God my God you got this excuse and you got that excuse I I, I hear you loud and clear God you got this excuse and you got that excuse and but you never said God excuse me you never said, God, excuse me, because I put all these other things in place of you, and you can't strengthen what you didn't give me to do. <laughs> Work can't give you what God needs you to do, and he's called you to be part of the remnant, but you are sitting on your blessed assurance and you're not doing what God has called you to do. And I'm not talking about in this house. I'm talking about out there because the kingdom suffers violence out there. The devil ain't wise enough to come up in here and try to. He's doing it out there and you're not in your rightful place. So we're, we're about to go off the air now. And, but my prayer for you is that you get in your rightful place. That you allow worship to supersede anything that you do. We send Judah first because worship has a way of decreasing the enemy's strength. Yeah. Worship has a way of taking away the power of the enemy. Because he does not like when you give the God that he despises worship. And I guarantee if you would get up out of your seat, out of your bed, out of your car, out of your chair and worship him, you will see that he will run 10 different ways. Because he doesn't like your worship. There's revival that's necessary. There's prayer that has to change if your prayer life, and he's taken me deeper in my prayer life, that your prayer life is going to be some things. It's going to kill some things, but it's also going to make some things live. It's time for shifting to happen. It's time for revival. Internal scars got to go because God is ready to move you to your next. <laughs>